We're glad to have Bruce with us today. Much has been said about Spring Congregation, the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation, because of our stand for the truth. I can never pass this up to think that when I was a boy, you know, Dub, that gets longer ago all the time. When I was a boy, we thought that about most of the congregations that were around. The same relationship, because we all believe and practice the same thing. So every generation must teach the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, on every component part of the New Testament system. Or we have these problems. Brother Bruce Stulting is a man who teaches the truth, it stands for the truth. It's already been said that he serves as one of the elders, and we have his fellow elders here with him today, but also as, as the preacher at the Fish Hatcher Road Congregation. He's been there since 2001, and we love them for their works faith, their faithful works, and their stand for the truth. We pray for them regularly. I hope they pray for us, think they do. And we need one another. And the whole thing about all of life, let's help each other go to heaven. And the only way that can be done, and that is to make sure we help each other know the truth about all things pertaining to life and godliness and encourage all to abide in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Brother Bruce, come speak to us on does the New Testament authorize the church to what? I'll reveal no New Testament pages. That's right. Is that right? Yes. You think you can handle you think you can handle that? To yeah, to fellowship denomination. Right. Everybody know what he's gonna speak on now? I got it written down right here. I just wanna see if you know. Yeah, I do. Got it right here. Does the New Testament authorize the church revealed on its pages to fellowship denominational churches? Can you tell us. You tell us. But don't tell us what you think. Tell us what the Bible says. That's right. New Testament authorized. That's the issue right there. You know, David gave me a limit on how many pages I could write, and he used one page to write the title. <laughs> he gave me a limit on how long I could speak, and it took him five minutes to <laughs> just to say the title. But it is good to be here. I enjoy being here. I appreciate the brethren for allowing me to be here to speak to this congregation. Uh, this is my folder that I carry my notes in. Uh, several of you have commented on that, uh, and actually good comments. My wife thought it was a poor choice, uh, but Ashton gave it to me this morning. To carry my notes in, I appreciate that, and I can be organized and good looking all at the same time. <laughs> What's that? No, no, I'm not that good looking. <laughs> anyway, you know, we think about this whole lectureship thing, the, the church of the New Testament and counterfeit churches. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? That's a hard, that's a hard way to look at that. That there's a church of the New Testament revealed in the New Testament and then there are other churches that are counterfeit. And we've proven them to be counterfeit by our study, by comparing those churches with the church of the New Testament. And we, and we find them to come up far short of what's revealed on the pages of the New Testament. And you know, there's a lot of people that really don't like us talking about error. They don't like us naming names. They don't like us talking about other people's beliefs. They certainly don't like us talking about their friends, their family. But you know what? We can only speak those things that are revealed for us on the pages of the New Testament. That's our, uh, our authority. That's our standard. That's why our question for this study is does the new testament authorize and whatever we practice in life and religion 
ought to start with that phrase. Does the New Testament authorize? I don't care whether it's part of our daily lives or part of the way we approach God in worship or the way we come to Him for, for forgiveness of our sins. It ought to begin, does the New Testament authorize? And what we're considering this evening, this afternoon rather, is does the New Testament authorize the church revealed on its pages? Does the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament, does it authorize it to fellowship denominational churches? Now see... We think about this word denomination, we use it all the time, but it comes from a Latin word that simply means to name. To name. That's where we get our, our word misnomer, which means to misname or misspeak. So when we talk about denominational churches, we're really using a misnomer because the denomination is not the church. It's not the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament. Let me ask the question. This isn't in the manuscript. This is P-Loan. This is something extra for nothing. Uh, I'm not going to charge you for this. You're going to get it free of charge. You're going to get what you pay for. Uh, and, uh, and so think about this. What denomination did Paul fellowship? Did Paul fellowship a denomination? Did Peter fellowship a denomination? If he did, which one did he fellowship? The fact is, Paul never fellowshiped one denomination in his life. Nor did any other church revealed on the pages of the New Testament fellowship any denomination. And I can say that without re reservation or fear of contradiction. You know why? Because there were no denominations in the first century for them to fellowship. So if they did not exist in the first century, they couldn't have been in fellowship with the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament. We got a history of that church, the beginning of that church, in the book of Acts. We have epistles that were written to, to congregations, to groups of congregations, to individuals in congregations, to leaders in congregations, to preachers, and, and, and information about elders who are going to be leaders. And not one of those individually or collectively ever fellowshiped a denomination because there were none to fellowship. We had to wait several hundred years. You can go ahead and turn on that first chart. We had to wait several hundred years before we have a denomination in existence. Notice the Catholic Church. This is the one that, that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica when he was talking about the second coming of Christ. And he said the second coming of Christ is not going to occur unless there's a falling away. And that falling away resulted in the Roman Catholic Church. And it began in 600 or 606 when they appointed the first universal pope. You know, we can go to the Bible, and I'm not going to do that. It's in the manuscript. But we can see prophecy concerning the establishment of the church. We can see preparation for the establishment of the church with John the baptizer. We can see Jesus promising to establish his church. We can see the church in perfection beginning in Acts chapter 2 when 3,000 were added to that church, Acts 2 verse 47, not to a denomination. And they were never in fellowship with the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because it was started by men 600 years later. It began in Rome instead of Jerusalem. It began in 606 rather than 33 AD. You see, they came a long way too late. And you know what's sad about this? People are so lacking in any type of spiritual knowledge today that they don't even realize that the church of which they are a member, if they're a member of a Protestant denomination, is not more than 500 years old. 
The very first Protestant denomination was started by, look at there, Martin Luther, his followers, not him. He didn't even start to set out to begin a new church. He was trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church because of things he didn't like about it. That's why he nailed those 99 theses, those questions, those criticisms of the Catholic Church to the door of the church building where he served his priest. He said, answer these questions. They couldn't. He was marked as a heretic by the Catholic Church. He didn't start out to form a denomination, but his followers did after his death. And so we have the formation in 7, uh, 1521, the very beginning of Protestant denomination, and that goes back just under or, or a little under 500 years. Now think about that. Martin Luther, Germany, wrong place, wrong time, wrong founder, not revealed in the scriptures. And then after that, one denomination after another denomination after another denomination after another denomination. When we think about the New Testament, and we think about the prophecies regarding Christ, the establishment of the church coming up to the, to the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. When those people were pricked in their heart and they cried out, and by the way, this has always been interesting to me, that here's Peter and the eleven standing up, they're preaching a sermon, and the sermon's not over, and the brethren, and the people interrupted the sermon because they were pricked in their heart, knew they were lost, and wanted to know what to do. When was the last time any of you gospel preachers was in the middle of a sermon and somebody realized what was that they were lost, stopped the sermon, and asked what to do? Notice the urgency of it. We're lost. We've killed the Messiah, the Christ. What do we do? Can you imagine the hopelessness that they must have felt? This is the Messiah, the one that God sent, and we killed him. What hope is there for us? And you know what Peter said? Repent ye, and be baptized every one of you for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then in verse, 5, uh, verse 41, 3,000 of those people that heard that command, that wasn't a good suggestion, that was a command. 3,000 of those that heard that word received it and they were baptized. In Acts 2.47 it says the Lord continued each day to add those who were being saved to the church, the church, singular in the Greek language, when you have the definite article, you're talking about a singular, unique thing. The Lord added the saved to the church. Those who were being saved were added to the church. Singular. His church, the one he promised to build. Matthew 16 and verse 18. The one and only church that he purchased with his blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. The one he promised to save. Ephesians 5 and verse 26. Now the question is, to which church, to which of these denominations did Christ add that 3,000? Not one. No one was ever in the first century church of times added to any one of these denominations or anyone that came along after them. Why? They didn't exist for hundreds of years. They came along too late to be part of the first century church. <clears throat> you know, we think about this. Denominationalism is incompatible. It's incompatible with New Testament Christianity. Denominationalism substitutes the traditions of men for the word of God, the doctrine of Christ. We would do well to recall the words of Jesus who stated... Full well ye reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Mark 7 and verse 9. This statement and this statement alone condemns every denomination in existence today from the Roman Catholic Church on. 
We live in a time when people have a shallow knowledge of spiritual things. And for that cause, they don't realize that the church of which they are a member is not ancient in origin. It's not connected with, authorized, or associated with in any way to the New Testament church. They came along too late, founded by men instead of Christ, and at the wrong place. Friends and brethren, there are many people who are in the Lord's, are in the de denominational world who are absolutely lost and don't even realize it. Don't even realize it. They're religious, they're sincere, but they're lost. And I'm talking about maybe our friends. Some of our friends are in denominations. Probably you have family in denominations. Your neighbors may be in denominations. People you work with are in denominations. Do you think that we have an obligation, not just a, a scriptural obligation, but a moral obligation? Of course we have a scriptural obligation. We're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have that scriptural obligation. But souls are in jeopardy. People are, are lost to really think they're saved. Do we not have a moral obligation to teach them the error of denominationalism? But I'll tell you what, friends and brethren, in my time as a preacher, I have come across a lot of people who don't like preaching against denominations. They just don't like it. You talked about the Baptist today. What if we had a Baptist visitor? What would happen? Well, first thing, they would have heard the truth. How bad could that be? Well, you might drive them off. Where are they going to go? They're lost. Can they get more lost? By exposing their denominational error, I'm giving them an opportunity to be saved. Can that be a bad thing? But yet many of my brethren just despise it. What about some of our brethren who have gone into error and we try to expose that and mark them and just like the Bible says? A lot of brethren don't like to hear that either. But we have an obligation to expose these things. I have a section in, uh, in the manuscript about the restoration movement and about uh, the formation of denominations, the formation of all these denominations and kind of a, a lesson from church history. And I'm going to leave that for your own reading because I don't have time to cover it in detail like I would like in the manuscript. So I want to go down to my next point and I want to talk about undenominational Christianity. But before I get there, I want to say this about the restoration movement. And I think it's important that we keep this in mind and that we teach it because I believe that a lot of our brethren have forgotten this. When we think about this idea of restoration, the restoration movement and those who were part of it were not seeking to form a new church or a new denomination. I am not a product of the restoration movement. Right. I do not have my roots in the restoration movement. I am not of the restoration heritage. I am of the New Testament. That's my heritage. That's my roots. And that's what those good men were doing, was trying to get the divided denominational world to go back beyond themselves and their origin and go back beyond Roman Catholicism and get back to the Bible and get back to New Testament, the primitive New Testament Christianity. And I believe, friends and brethren, that we don't preach on that enough because our brethren seem to have forgotten where we truly come, from where we truly come. But what we need to realize, and I'm going to emphasize it again at this point, there were no denominations in the first century in Acts chapter 2. Every person obeyed the same gospel, became members of the same body, and ultimately 
wore the same name. Anyone taking the time to read the New Testament will discover the Lord's church. And that it still exists today. The New Testament reveals a few facts about the church. Next chart, please. That we want to consider. <laughs> when we think about the New Testament church and facts about that church. Jesus prophesied that he would build his church. I want to emphasize that. Matthew 16 and verse 18. How many churches did Jesus say he was going to build? Church is singular. I don't care what uh, manuscript you go to in the Greek language, it's still singular. And it's always going to be singular. Jesus never promised to build more than one church. He never promised to build a church other than his. Jesus said that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. Daniel 2.44, it's an eternal kingdom. And I believe with all my heart that on Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, 33 AD, that the church has been existing on the earth since that time. We may not be able to prove that historically, but I know it's a fact nonetheless. And let's think about this. Let's think, well, maybe I'm wrong. Since we can't prove it from, from history, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm just all washed up. But you know what? It still exists in the seed. Acts chapter, I mean Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, the seed is the word of God in that parable of the sower. And if we take that same 2,000 year old seed and we plant it today, we're going to get the same thing that it produced in the first century. Right. It's not going to produce a denomination. It's going to produce the Lord's church. That's the nature of a seed. If I plant watermelons, I don't expect to grow cucumbers. That's the seed principle. Everything reproduces after its kind. Sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. If we sow the word of God in the hearts of good and honest people, we're going to produce a Christian. And when those individual Christians gather together in one place to worship God, we have a congregation. We have a church. A church, if they worship according to the pattern of the New Testament, is the church of Christ. The church for which Jesus died. The church for which he prayed. The church he promised to build. The one he purchased with his blood. And it's going to be his church. It was established miraculously on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 through 47. God added the saved. Those who repented of their sins. And were baptized for remission of sin. They were added to that church. Not to a denomination. Acts 2 and verse 47. The church was called the body. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And we see in Ephesians 4 and verse 4 that there's only one body. Remember, can you count to one? Can you count to one? That may sound simple. That may sound like I'm joking, but I'm just dead serious. Can you count to one? I didn't take the time to count how many denominations I had listed up here. Uh, 15 or 20. Can you count to one? There's one body. Ephesians chapter 1 verse, verse 21 and 22. God has been given Christ to be head over all things to his church which is his body. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if there's one body and the body is the church then there's only one church. Can you count to one? Can you count to one? Jesus is the head of the church. Colossians 1 and verse 18. There's not a, heaven, a, a heavenly vicar and an earthly vicar as Roman Catholics would teach. There's only one Lord over the church and that's Jesus. The church of Jesus Christ met on the first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. They practiced simple New Testament worship. They worship God in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5 and verse 19, they sang a cappella without instrumental music. They gave as they were prospered. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. They ate the communion supper, Acts 20 and verse 7. Followed Bible example of prayer, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. They heard God's word preached. God's word. 
not the opinions of men, not human philosophy, not doctrines and commandments of men, but they heard God's word preached. Acts 20 and verse 27, or verse 7. The church is not man-made. It's not an earthly denomination. It is the church of Jesus Christ. At present, there are hundreds of religious denominations all wearing different names, teaching different doctrines, practicing different forms of worship, teaching in many different plans of salvation, wearing different names in religion. How could anyone conclude that, uh, from the scriptures that that's authorized? When we find so plainly taught in the scripture that there was only one church in the first century. Next chart, please. We're going to contrast denominations with the Lord's church, the church of Christ. Denominations, by its very nature, teach us that there's many bodies. They want to make the Lord's church a freak. I saw a two-headed calf one time. That would represent the Roman Catholic Church, head on earth and head in heaven. Jesus the head, the Pope the head, two-headed cat, that's a freak. Saw, saw it in what they used to call a freak show at the carnival. They don't have freak shows at the carnival anymore. I saw an animal that had one head and two bodies. It too was a calf. I don't know where they come up with these things. But it had one head and two bodies. That's descriptive of denominations. Again, I saw it in a freak show. Denominationalism is making a freak out of the body of Christ. That's what it does. And that's sad because it, 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 it takes something that's pure and beautiful that comes from God and His Son and turns it into something despicable. And repulsive. One body, one church. Matthew 16 and verse 18. It's founded by men. That's the denominations. Founded by Christ. Big differences here. Have human heads and denominations. Christ is the head. Human creeds. The Bible is only creed. We follow the Bible, not man's doctrine. Wear human names. Wear only the name of Christ. Membership in denominations is not necessary in order to be saved, how many times you heard those, those TV evangelists like uh, Oral Roberts and, uh, and Billy Graham, especially Billy Graham, he says, okay, now that you're saved, say the sinner's prayer. When you're saved, go find a church of your choice. You know what that means? That the denominational church is not necessary for salvation. And I agree with that. I agree with it. The Lord's church is necessary for salvation. The nominations are not necessary, but the Lord's church is essential. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. They preach many gospels, but the Bible teaches there's only one gospel. But some would pervert the gospel, and those who pervert the gospel are accursed by God. Constantly reviving, reviving their creed, revising their creed. The Bible remains the same uh, now and forever. Many faiths, the Bible teaches one faith. Many baptisms, the Bible teaches one baptism. Join churches as opposed to the Lord as you to the church. Abiding in the branches of denomination as opposed to abiding in Christ who is the true vine. And that context is talking about individuals and not churches. Walk by different rules. We're supposed to walk in the Lord's church by the same rule. Thank God in prayer for so many churches when Jesus prayed for only one. That was his church. <clears throat> Next chart, please. In the first century, Christians were members of the universal church of Jesus Christ. When one accepts Christ, there's no need to accept anything else. Just accept Christ. One obeys the gospel of Christ, one becomes a Christian, a disciple of Christ. When this pattern is followed by anyone, anywhere, the result is a Christian only. The Bible cannot produce a denomination, nor can a denomination produce a Christian. Let's look at some characteristics of undenominational Christianity. Has no denominational founder. Has no denominational head. Has no denominational creed. 
You know, think about that. And you've probably heard it said before, if it contains more than the Bible, it has too much. If it contains less than the Bible, it doesn't have enough. It contains the same as the Bible. You don't need it because you already have it, right? No creed. But the Bible, we don't need denominational creed. It has no denominational name. We use only scriptural name. We list those in the manuscript. Has no denominational organization organized after the New Testament pattern with Jesus as the head of the universal church, elders over uh, seeing individual uh, over the universal church. Jesus is the head, elders overseeing individual congregation. Has no denominational worship, has no denominational requirements for membership. Now we're going to look at some manners pertaining to fellowship. I think we've got enough time. Again, we're going to move over some things. But I do want to say this. We think about this idea of denominationalism, having to come back again and, 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 and teach these lessons that we ought to already know. George Patton, General Patton said, I don't like to pay for the same real estate twice. And by that he meant... After he fought a battle and won the battle, he didn't want to have to fall back, regroup, and then go have to fight for the same territory that he's already got. We think about the restoration movement. We, and, and, and David made mention of this, of this earlier in a way when he said that this congregation was standing on the shoulders of Al Brown and the work that he'd done here. Well, we're really standing a, a great deal on the shoulders of many of the restoration preachers they exposed denominationalism for what it was they fought these battles that we're still having to fight today and it's a shame that we have to take time away from other important areas of work and expend resources and time regaining the ground that they already fought and won but yet here we are denominations running rampant uh, we got we have uh, the uh, community churches compromise. We have all these different things that we're discussing this week, and it's been dealt with time and again. But yet, still, our brethren still don't seem to get the picture. Don't seem to see the the, necess the necessity of it. I want to talk a little bit about this next chart, God's circle of fellowship. And I made it into a circle because of Barry Grider and his bulletin. Barry Grider is a, pre a preacher of Forest Hill Church of Christ, Memphis, Tennessee. He's also the editor of their bulletin, the Forest Hill News. February 10th, 2009, Barry published a compromising article entitled, I Got Used to It, and published another even more compromising article, if that's possible, article by Tyler Young. But in the same issue was an article commonly used by the denominational churches titled, I Drew My Circle Again. This article is about a fictional character who becomes a Christian and then continues to redraw his circle of fellowship until he's the only one in it. Now, you know, the whole point of this article is twofold. Number one. It ridicules those who are concerned with matters of fellowship. And number two, it implies that fellowship's not really that important to begin with. Now, where do you think Barry Grider's going? Barry Grider's a change agent just like the ones we've been talking about the last two years. And when we get to this chart here, let's look at this chart starting on the far left corner. You know, unity's demanded. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, we have seven ones. Remember, can you count to one? There's only one of those things. They're unique. Unity is desirable. Psalm 33 and verse 1. It's a blessing and it's a joy for brethren to dwell together in unity. Jesus prayed for unity. John 17, verse 20 and 21. Ephesians 2, verse 14 through 16. God reconciled both Jews and Gentiles. That doesn't leave anybody else in one body. Right? In one body. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Be of the same mind, the same judgment. That's unity. 1 John 1, seven. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us of all iniquity. 
You know, back in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, Brother Dub mentioned this verse in his lecture on the restoration plea. You shall not add unto the word of God. And then, you know, in the last half of that verse, he tells us why. You don't add to it or diminish aught from it. Why? So that you'll be able to keep the commandments of God. If we add to the word of God or we diminish from it, we don't have it anymore. We don't have God's word anymore. And if we diminish from it, we change it, we pervert it, we no longer have an opportunity to obey God. And that's the situation that the denominational world finds themselves in. They no longer have the word of God because they have a perverted gospel. And the thing about a perverted gospel is it will not and cannot ever save. And they cannot obey the word of God because they no longer possess the word of God. Divisions condemn. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3, he says, you know, you're carnal minded. And one of the reasons I know you're carnal minded is because there's division among you. Those people who practice denominational division are carnal minded. They're not spiritual minded because if they were, they'd get back to the Bible. That's the idea there. Romans 16, 17, and 18. Mark those that cause division and offenses contrary to Christ, the doctrine of Christ. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. One of the things that God hates is division. Acts 20, verse 30. Philippians 3 and verse 16. Division is condemned over and over in the Bible. But yet all, all division is not condemned. Just like all unity is not accepted. That's right. There's some division that we have to make. We think about the, the light of God's word. In him is light and there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from all sin. Now here's the question. Right here inside of our circle we see these represented as light. We see everything outside of the circle represented as darkness. Only those inside the circle are in fellowship with God. Remember, God draws the circle. I don't. And at the center of that circle is Jesus Christ. And if I step out of the side of the circle, then what? I have not God. 2 John 9. Whosoever abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. But if I transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, I have not God. God is in the circle. Christ is in the circle. The faithful are in the circle. But if somebody comes along, those inside the circle, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the, the scripture is profitable for doctrine. We accept the Bible only. What about those that accept human creeds? Well, they're outside the circle. If I want to fellowship denominations, I have to go outside the circle and give up God. You know, we, I've seen a lot of articles, I've seen tracts written on guilt by association. Okay? Guilt by association. And, and I, I agree with the principle they're teaching, but we need to really reword that and say guilt by sin. Guilt by sin. If I associate with a sinner, I become a sinner. Guilt by sin. I'm, I'm in sin because of what I chose to do. Not because I stood too close to somebody in error. By extending fellowship with that person, I sin. And I depart from Christ. I depart from God. What about those we, we teach that the, the, we are to go by the church? Are Christians. Acts 11 and verse 26. They go by sectarian names, societies. See, we have to, again, cross the line if we're going to fellowship denominations. And we go all the way around here. Let's stop right here. I want to let y'all co cover those. But I want to stop right here and talk about this one. Here's the organization of the church, elders and deacons. Denominations have human organizations. They have human officers. They have uh, uh, an organization that's sometimes worldwide. That's foreign to the scriptures. You know, if we, if, if, if they, since they've corrupted the organization of the church, 
They're out of fellowship with God. And if we want to fellowship them, we have to cross that line, right? And if we cross the line, sure, we're in fellowship with them, but we're no longer in fellowship with God right. or the faithful. We, there's consequences to that. There's consequences to action. Now let's stop for just a minute. Remember the Boston Crossroads movement? What did they do to the eldership? They corrupted it. They taught error on it. Are we in fellowship with the Boston Crossroads movement? No. And rightly so. Okay. What about others that would say that, that the elders have no authority, but they lead by example only? Are we in fellowship with them? No, because they teach error, and we're right not to be in fellowship with them. What if somebody comes along and teaches reaffirmation of elders, reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders, which is error? Which side of the line are they on? Are they over here with God and Christ and the faithful, or have they left and they're over here with the same as the denominations. And what about those that extend fellowship to them? Not guilt by association, but that, that is true, but guilt by sin. If we get, bid God speed to somebody that brings another doctrine than the doctrine of Christ, what happens? We're just as guilty of sin as they are. Because we partake of their evil deeds. We have several things listed here. And by, me, by all means we could have more. How many of these areas of sin. Does one have to participate in. Before we can have fellowship. Does somebody have to go into full fledged denominationalism. And deny or, 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 or deny the existence of the Lord's church. As the change agents do. How many errors do they have to teach or practice before we can't have fellowship with them anymore? I don't know about you, but my Bible still reads in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin, how many? Sin, which one? Any. The wages of sin is death. That's right. It only takes one sin for someone to be lost. And it only takes one sin. For fellowship to be broken. And as we've proven in this lesson. Denominationalism is involved. In many more. Than just one sin. So in short. The answer to the question is. Does the New Testament authorize the church. Revealed on its pages. To fellowship denominations. The simple answer is. Absolutely not. Because they're in error. And we can have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather, we should reprove them. Thank you for your time. Hearing these sermons made me, well, I thought about it a lot of time, but it's renewed it in my mind today that what you heard this afternoon and throughout the lectureship, especially a sermon like this, and what you're going to hear in the next hour. This is what brought the church to us. This is what led people out of sectarianism, denominationalism. Men suffered for these types of sermons. Men were excluded from all sorts of things as far as families and churches were concerned. I wish you could read the letters that Barton Warren Stone was writing back about 1810 as he was taking his stand on the Bible, the Bible only, and beginning to oppose anything the Bible did not authorize. And uh, he was virtually, in fact, he was sort of like Elijah. He thought he was pretty much by himself there for a while. He published his material in the basement of his house. You can still go to that house and you can still walk in that basement and uh, see where he did that for the historical aspects of the matter. But we quit preaching this kind of thing somewhere back down the road. 
I dare say Dub can very well remember. This is the kind of preaching I'm sure his father did and, and he's done. And, but when we stop it, then we can expect just what we get when we stop preaching the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which means you must expose error. It's just that way. Brother Warren, and I'll stop here, and if you read his material, you'll see it on emphasizing we must do only what's authorized by the New Testament. He had, in fact, he was a good artist, so he would draw uh, some sort of pole or, as we used to say back at home, a stob in the ground. <laughs> and he would stretch out so far what would represent a rope, a line. And he would say, now there's the authority of, of God as to what we should do right here, just that long. Then he would draw another line longer than that, and then he would draw one shorter than that. And he would say, the one line I first drew is just exactly representing God's word. That's as long as he wants it. The other is where men decided it was too short and made it longer, and others decided it was too long and made it shorter. The idea of loosing where God is not loosed and the idea of binding where God is not bound as far as obligatory matters are concerned and becoming a Christian, living the Christian life and all these matters that pertain to the New Testament church. Well, if you think about it, it's like a compass and you draw a circle. Then if you're in going by the boundaries of the longer line, which is where men said the line wasn't long enough, then you're outside of the fellowship of God. If you pull the line back in, that's too short. That's uh, less liberty than what the Lord grants you in his authoritative word. Then that circle's too short. You want the circle that's drawn by the line of God's authority. It's just long enough and short enough. God knew what he was doing. Let's don't mess with it. So when you have fellowship, it has to be according to God's truth. It has to be as far out as the truth goes, as short as the truth is. And we'll be just what we ought to be. And we must be content with that. The problem is men aren't. That's always been the problem. Men aren't content with what the Bible says. And everything you go into and all these various false doctrines, it always comes down to this. I want to do more, have more liberty than what God's infallible word allows me. Or I'm no more in God and... I need to make the line shorter and bind where God is not in his authoritative word bound. There's the whole problem. Will we submit to God's will according to the meaning of the words in the rightly divided New Testament? If, if we are, then we respect his authority. So we can only fellowship those people that are in fellowship with God. Well, how do you know who's in fellowship with God? Well, you can tell by the length of line on them. <laughs> That's how far. If it's longer than the authoritative word of God... They're too far out there. If it's shorter, they pulled it in too short. And I have no authority to fellowship anybody that's going too long or too short. But I can fellowship everybody that's in fellowship with God. And can I know that? I think Bruce and others have made it very clear. You can know it. But will you be content with it and humble before God and submit to his will? See, it's all a matter of submission. And that's exactly where matters are.